so the title of the sermon this morning is Zacchaeus' Salvation. Zacchaeus' Salvation. And this is a real common uh, passage of Scripture. This is something you'll probably, most people are familiar with. Um, you know, if you've been in church at all, especially if you've been in any kind of a Sunday school or anything like that, or if you came up in, in uh, children's ministries, you know, everyone kind of hears the story of Zacchaeus. You know, they sing the song, you know, Zacchaeus was a wee little, there, see, people are already catching on, a wee little man was he. Who's ever heard that song, right? Yeah, lots of people. So this is a real familiar passage, but I think there's some things we can look at here when it comes to salvation, as particularly in Zacchaeus' case, that we can apply, and things that we, I think we should be mindful about as people who go out and knock doors and try to witness to other people and share the gospel of Christ with others. And that's, you know, that's what we're about here. That's the thrust of what this ministry is. That's what we'll always be about. Yes, preaching the word. Yes, getting up and, and having uh, you know the preaching of the word, the fellowship, and everything else. But we're here to accomplish the mission, you know, in Tucson, which is to knock every door. And uh, I think there's some things that we can we can learn from Zacchaeus' salvation and keep in mind as we go about uh, preaching the gospel. Now you're there in Luke chapter 19. Go over to keep something there. We'll come back several times, but go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. So in Luke chapter 19, the Bible says in verse one. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. So, he, you know, the scripture is telling us a few things about this man, and it's pointing out the fact that not only was he the chief among the publicans, but also that he was rich. So Zacchaeus was one who had a lot of wealth. You know, and there's a lot right there that we should learn from, is the fact that we don't want to get this attitude where we just write off rich people. You know, and I've seen this kind of attitude, and I probably have even been guilty of it to some degree myself, where you know, we go into the more affluent neighborhoods, you go into the nicer places where people are a little better off or wealthy, you go into the gated community, and we kind of go, sometimes people can go in there with an attitude of, well, nothing's going to happen here. I mean, just look at these houses. And they can even get such a bad attitude to the point where you know, their demeanor at the door is even poor. You know, and, and and I only bring it up because of the fact that I know it happens. You know, as, as deacon, part of my duties is, you know, receiving the emails and the phone calls that come into the church, you know, and, 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 as, and I know it's not really a problem down here. You know, I've never gotten a call about it down here, but, you know, we're a smaller church, and really we haven't spent a lot of time in the more affluent neighborhoods. You know, we've been in South Tucson, the more poor areas of Tucson, which is, you know, where we want to go. That's where Jesus put the emphasis. But he, you know, he also did go reach the rich. You know, we, this is a great example of it. You know, and I'm kind of bringing it up because of the fact, you know, I do receive those calls, you know, from people who say, hey, you had some people here, you know, and I'm just letting you know, they were kind of rude. <laughs> Their attitude kind of stank. You know, they, I said I wasn't interested politely, you know, and they just kind of just gave me a dejected look and turned away without even saying anything. You know, I'm not one of these people that thinks that, you know, if someone doesn't want to hear what I have to say, I'm just going to not say anything and walk away. I'm going to say, okay, have a nice day. Thanks. God bless you. Happy New Year. Whatever, you know, Merry Christmas, you know, unless it's July or something. That would be odd, right? But I, I say a nice, warm, you know, greeting, a nice, warm goodbye, and go on my way. Because you have to remember when we're out there, you know, whether, it's door, you know, whether you're going door to door, whether you're witnessing to somebody even in your personal life, you know, and trying to share Christ with them, if they reject you, you know, uh, they're not really rejecting you, they're rejecting Christ. You know, it's not, anyone could bring that message and that's what they would reject. It's not necessarily you. But, it, you know, that's not an excuse either to just, well, let me just treat them like mud then. Let me just treat these people like dirt because, you know, after all, it doesn't matter if they reject me, they're rejecting Christ. You know, but people can develop this attitude when they get into more, uh, or areas that are less receptive. They start to get this attitude of, well, you know, these people are wealthy, so we can just treat them however. You know, that should not be the case. And it's interesting because I got this email from this guy, and he's like, hey, I'm just letting you know your people were here. And I, I politely said I wasn't interested, you know, and they just, they just literally turned away without even saying anything. They just turned their back on me, didn't say goodbye, just look, and he's just saying, I'm just letting you know they're not going to get anywhere with that attitude. And I, at first I was like, well, I'm going to give this guy a piece of my mind, you know. <laughs> try to stick up for these guys, but I was like, hey, we appreciate your feedback. You know, I can assure you that, you know, that wasn't something that we promote here. We always try to encourage our people to have a good demeanor at the door. You know, they're less than perfect. Maybe they're having a bad day. And he wrote back, he's like, well, I understand that. You know, and he, and he even said, you know, I'm not a believer. He says, but man, we could really use a Christian attitude in this country today. 
So even an unbeliever understands that, you know, we as Christians should be known as people of peace and love and gentleness, that we should have, uh, you know, a certain demeanor about us. You know, you know if, we're, if we're saved and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, we should have those fruits of joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, all these things. We should have those fruits of the spirits in our, in our life. And if you know, we're saved and we don't have that, we may want to you know, take a step back and ask ourselves, why don't I have the fruit of the Spirit in my life? Why am I you know, a cantankerous, contentious, angry person? And I'm not saying there's never a time and place to get angry or, or to contend, but I am saying you know, if that's always the case with us, you know, especially when we go into a rich neighborhood and we just say, well, look at, you know, they got a nice huge driveway and a manicured lawn. I'm just going to, you know, have a bad attitude. You know, that's not the fruit of the Spirit. We need to check ourselves. I mean, that's not Jesus' attitude. He didn't see Zacchaeus up in the tree. He said, well, he's rich. I'm just going to move along. You know, he, he took the time to stop and talk to the poor, to the rich. He was not a respecter of persons, and neither should we. Should we. You know, Jesus loved and ministered to the wealthy. You know, we put a lot of emphasis here on reaching the poor, and we should, but let's not forget the fact that we also are here to minister to the wealthy. You know, Jesus didn't walk by Zacchaeus and say, you know, I'll, I'll come eat at your house, but how much money do you have in your bank? You know, uh, how, you know what's your check balance at? You know, do you, how much, what's your, what's your uh, annual gross income before I fellowship with you? Oh, that's too much. Sorry, I can't be seen with you. Or I can't, I can't, you know, have any compassion towards you because, you know, you make too much money. No, that's not his attitude. Jesus ministered to the wealthy as well as the rich. If you look there in Mark 10, verse 17, it says, And when he was gone forth and away, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Look at verse 18. Jesus said unto them, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not com uh, commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I done, I have observed from my youth. Jesus then beholding him, went, liar. Because this is the rich young ruler. You know, we know from other contexts, right? No, it says Jesus beholding him loved him. I mean, despite all this guy's pride and arrogance and those statements, oh, I've done all these things, you know, I, what, what else lack I yet? Despite this guy's, you know, his affluence, how well off he was, and we'll even see that here in later in the scripture, it says he had great possessions. You know, Jesus still loved him because that person, you know, he saw beyond their bank account, the things that they own, the possessions that they had, whatever. He saw beyond all that and just saw another soul that needed to get saved. Someone else that needed to receive Christ as Savior. And that's the attitude we should have. I think this is an important lesson we can learn from the story of Zacchaeus and his salvation. He said unto him in verse 21, Then Jesus beholding him loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went and grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? You know, if that's the case with rich people, you know, that, that should not compel us to be more, you know, to be cold hearted or to be short with them. That should compel us to have even more compassion for them. Because they have even a more difficult time of entering into the kingdom of God. Because of their riches. And Jesus clarifies here what he means by that. He says in the disciples, verse 24, were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? So the problem was not you know, the wealth itself, it was the fact that the rich man was trusting in his riches. It was where his trust was. But unfortunately for wealthy people, that's kind of what they do. They, a lot of wealthy people will view religion as something, well, that's just for you know, weak people. That's just for poor people who need a crutch to lean on. You know, I'm somebody who's made something of myself. You know, I've worked hard. I've pulled myself up by my bootstraps and went out there and worked hard and made something of myself. You know, and what they're doing is they're trusting in themselves. They're tr trusting in their own riches. They're saying, well, why, I don't need any of that. I mean, look how well I've done. Look how prosperous I am. I, you know, I've worked hard. And, you know, a lot of times people come into those riches by honest means. Not every rich person out there is some corrupt individual. A lot, of, you know, a lot of people work hard and they, and they endeavor, they make their life all about that and they make a lot of money and they do it through honest means often. <clears throat> but the problem is, is that because of that, they then begin to trust in those riches and it makes it more difficult for them to enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
And that should compel us to have more compassion for them, not less. You know, when we go to the affluent or the wealthy or the, you know, better off neighborhoods and knock on these doors, you know, we should probably be even nicer. We should probably try, you know, you think, oh, you're going to the ghetto. That's where you want to make sure you're extra nice in the ghetto, right? Because, you know, you, you don't want to make some gangbanger mad or something like that. You don't want to get you know, beat down out in the street, you know, say the wrong thing. But actually, it's the other way around. I'm not saying go to the ghetto and run your mouth, by the way. <laughs> don't do that. Still be nice, okay? But I'm just saying, you know, we should be at least as nice as that in these, in these rich neighborhoods. But sometimes we go in there and just think, well, I'm in some wealthy neighborhood, and pff, these people probably aren't going to get saved anyway. And you know what? They probably aren't. They're probably not going to come back with, you know, several salvations in all likelihood. That's true. But again, that should compel us to be more compassionate, not less. That should compel us to be nicer, not less. You know, on Wednesday nights in Tempe, we've been going into the, you know, the nicer parts of Chandler, Tempe, and stuff like that. And we've been doing it for two years now. You know, we've, we've knocked all the poor areas, some of them several times over in, in Tempe. And it gets to a point where there's a law of diminishing returns, where you've just, you know, you've squeezed all the salvations you can out of that poor neighborhood, right? And now you're starting to recognize people. They're recognizing you. They're saying, you knocked my door, you know, multiple times. I know people have had that happen. So now we're going to these wealthier neighborhoods, and you know what? We'll go out there with 15 people, van load of people, and we'll come back with one salvation. And you're going to say, well, and we praise God for that. But you know, if I took that same amount of people and spent that same amount of time in a, you know, a more receptive neighborhood, we'd probably get more people saved, you know? But we're just never supposed to just completely ignore the wealthy. What about that one person there that would have gotten saved? And maybe we'd even see more salvations if people made sure that they had a compassionate attitude when they went into these wealthier neighborhoods. Like Jesus had for a man who was rich named Zacchaeus. Because <laughs> don't forget, let's look at there in Mark chapter 10, the latter end there, it says in verse 26, and they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? You know, they're already getting that attitude. Well, it looks, sounds like they're on their way to hell. Who can get saved then? Well, you know, nuts to them, too bad. Well, enjoy your wealth. But Jesus reminds them in verse 27, And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Look, the, the gospel is just as powerful in the ghetto as it is in Beverly Hills. It's just as powerful in the low-income areas as it is in the high-income areas. The gospel still has the same power. God could still work. God could still use that in someone's life. And here's the thing, you know, God is the one, we understand in John, I won't go there for sake of time, but he said, Jesus said, except the Father, no man can come unto me except the Father draw him. You know, it takes God to get somebody saved. And I don't mean that in some Calvinistic sense, like, you know, God, you know it's God's will that only certain people get saved and others don't. You know, God is not willing that any should perish, that he is the Savior of all of men, especially those that believe. You know, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But what the point I'm making is this, is that, you know, it took God to draw you to salvation just as much as it's going to take God to draw anybody else to salvation. And God didn't, you know, just show favor because he said, well, you're not as wealthy. You know, you're poor, so let me just, you know, make an exception for you. God, he, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Rich, poor, doesn't matter what income, doesn't matter what nationality, doesn't matter any of that. God wants all men to be saved. So don't write off rich people. Don't just say, oh, that guy's driving a Benz or whatever. He's got a gold watch. I'm not even going to bother trying to witness to this guy. I'm not even going to try and, and, and help this person who I perceive as being wealthier. And, you know, wealth is such a, you know, rich is such a subjective term anyway. You know, the person who's eating ramen every night looks at the guy who's, you know, ordering out and says, well, that guy's rich, right? He gets to go to Chipotle, and I'm here eating ramen, you know. But the guy eating Chipotle is looking at the guy who's, you know, going over to, you know, some sit-down dinner somewhere at, you know, Texas Roadhouse every other, you know, and he said, well, he's the rich one. You know, what we consider rich, that that person might say, well, I'm really not that wealthy. Like, here's a perfect example. Being poor in America, <laughs> right? Poor people. Now, there are poor people in America, I believe. There, there's people that are, 
things are pretty rough, but it's, 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 hard, it's fewer and far between. You have to kind of go looking for that. You know, most, especially in like the major metro areas, you know, the poor people, it, they still manage to have a cell phone, they still have internet, you know, they still manage to go and, you know, get cigarettes and everything else, but they're the poor people, right? Like they would say, I'm poor, you know, I got so many kids and one income, boy, you, you're just, you're destitute, apparently. But I'm up here, I got good clothes on, you know, not expensive, but, the, you know, they, they're doing the job. You know, I'm, I'm doing all right. You can tell I'm well fed, right? <laughs> I'm not hurting for my next meal, but I'm the poor person in America today because I don't make, you know, f you know it's the people who make less than X amount of dollars are considered poor. The point I'm making is this, is that poor is a subjective, or rich, poor, it's kind of a subjective term anyways. I believe what he's talking about with, with the example of uh, Zacchaeus here is that this is a man of great wealth. This is a man a lot, who has a lot of money. Because it says there that he was the chief of publicans. So he was like the publican of publicans. He was the guy that was overseeing all the other publicans, and they were all ripping each other off, and it you know, that all kind of flows up. So this guy had a lot of money. This guy really was rich. <coughs> so don't write off rich people. Don't write off people that just because, you know, they, they, they have wealth or maybe they just seem to have or what we perceive as wealth. Have compassion on them. Jesus did. But don't write off bad people with a bad reputation either. I think that's something else you can see from the story. If you look there in uh, Luke chapter 19, I'm going to look there at uh, verse 7. And it says in verse 7, and they saw it, of course, Jesus is talking about him going to eat with them. They says, and they saw it, the Pharisees, and they all murmured, saying, that he hath gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. So that was Zacchaeus' reputation, that he was a sinner. Now, we understand that we're all sinners, right? But what they're saying is that, you know, this is the Pharisees and the Sadducees speaking. They're saying, well, this is a guy who rips people off, defrauds people, doesn't keep the law. And they were hypocrites about it anyway. But this was his reputation. He was, uh, you know, publicans were not popular people. They're, they're the IRS of their day. You know, they're the tax man. Did you write a Christmas card to, your, to the tax man this year? Did you, you know, did you send, a, did you send some, a, a, a little box of goodies to the IRS to thank them for the good job that they're doing, taking your money before you see any of it? No, no, you know, no one here, I don't think anyway, loves, you know, having taxes taken from them. You know, and if you do, that's, that's fine. It's a little odd, you know. I think maybe you bumped your head somewhere along the way, but the point is this, is that, you know, Zacchaeus was not a popular guy. He had a bad reputation. And he even admits it in the story. He says, if I've defrauded any man, you know, if I've lied to some guy and took more than what was, what was you know, if I robbed some guy, you know, and, and took more than I was supposed to, I give it back, you know, fourfold or whatever. You know, he, he's, he's admitting that he's a rotten guy. And everyone knows it. Oh, he's going to eat with that sinner, Zacchaeus. Did you see that? He didn't come to my house. He went to eat with that, that, that chief of the publicans. He had a, so, but did Jesus write him off? Did Jesus walk up to the sycamore tree and say, what was your name again? Oh, I heard about you. Yeah, never mind. Take a good look because this is all you're going to get, Zacchaeus. No, he said, come down. I'm going to eat with you today. And, and he went and he ate with them. You know, I think sometimes it's good for us to, to, remember, to remind ourselves that we shouldn't really look down on others. And, and if you would, go over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'll read to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Don't write off people that have a bad reputation. Whether it's as a tax collector or maybe they have a checkered past or something like that. You know, people hold that over, things over people's heads that they have no right holding over their heads today. You know, and people that end up, you know, doing time or something like that for some crime that they probably, you know, biblically speaking, they shouldn't have even gone to jail for. And yet we have a system today that just holds it over their head. And every time they try to get a job, it's a background check. And, you know, it, it's, it's stupid. People have these kind of things held over the head. And they try to give people a bad reputation, right? Don't hold somebody's, you know... The, don't, don't write off people that have a bad reputation because sometimes that bad reputation isn't even warranted. It's not even, it's not even that right. It's wrong. You know, sometimes it's well earned, right? In the case of Zacchaeus, you know, he, didn't, he didn't, wasn't suffering unjustly. Like, he deserved what he got, right? Because he was a thief. He was a liar. He was defrauding people. 
It's no, you know, don't, don't go, you know, if you're considering what you want to do for a job, don't go be a tax guy and expect to be everybody's best friend. You know, it's like kind of like the dentist, right? I remember being told, I've never fact-checked this, but someone told me that dentists for a long time had the highest suicide rate. Because who likes to go to the dentist? You know, it's nothing personal, Doc, but it's just that, you know, you're in there, you're drilling, you're poking, you're prodding, you're, you're pulling things out. You know, not exactly the most popular guy, right? But we're glad we have them, right? But I think sometimes people write off people that have, you know, a, a, a bad reputation or what they've been told is a bad reputation, and they don't consider themselves. They don't consider the fact that, you know, in God's eyes, we've all had a bad reputation. That we're all sinners. You know, in 1 Corinthians 6, you're in 1 Timothy 1, but he says, Paul wrote and, wrote, and he said, uh, you know, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. He said, God's not going to have anything to do with people like this. But then he says in verse 11, and such were some of you. He says, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You know, the only reason any of us has a reputation good enough, of he good enough for heaven is because of Christ. You know, and we, so we shouldn't write off other people just because they have a bad reputation or we're told that they have a bad reputation, whatever. We should not write them off. And it's interesting there he says, and such were some of you. He doesn't say, and such were all of you. You know, there's some people that are never going to have a bad reputation. You know, I think about kids that are growing up in a Christian home, you know, that if, as long as they walk with the Lord and they're faithful to the Lord and they, and they do the things of God, they're probably not going to grow up and be known as, you know, somebody with a bad reputation. In fact, they're probably going to have a good reputation. But here's the thing. Every single one of us has the potential to have a bad reputation. Even if we don't have one, we all have the potential to go get one. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. You want to talk about a guy that had a bad reputation, look at the Apostle Paul. And by the way, a reputation that was earned and warranted before he got saved. He says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. He didn't say who was called these things. He says, No, that's exactly what I was. I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorant and unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am chief. Paul's saying, I had a really bad reputation. You know what? That didn't stop God from saving. In fact, I am the exact person that Christ came into the world to save. And we can all say that because we're all sinners. Because and that, and we're all sinners, and Christ came in the world to save sinners. And look, you might have a good reputation, and that's great. Keep it that way. Don't lose that. But understand this. That doesn't give you the right to write, uh, the, 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 the right to write off other people. You know, in that term, write people off, you know, dismiss them as unimportant. Just because they have a bad reputation. That all of a sudden, well, I, I would give them the gospel. I would... You know, I would be kind to this person, except they have a bad reputation, therefore don't deserve it. That's the wrong attitude. And I think that's, what we're, that's why the story of Zacchaeus is in here, to kind of check our attitude when it comes to other people, to the unsaved. To, you know, we're, we are to be like Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. We are to be Christ-like. You know what? And he was a compassionate person who loved people that were, had a bad reputation, even when it was earned. And he even loved wealthy people. He didn't just write people off. You know, not all wealthy people are bad. I think sometimes people get this in their head that, you know, if you have wealth, then you must be a bad person. That's not true at all. <coughs> the Bible says in 1 Timothy, where you are in verse, uh, 12, chapter 1, verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Oh, I'm sorry, I just read that. Go to Luke 7. Luke 7. Not all wealthy people, we're going to come back to 1 Timothy later, but not all wealthy people are bad. <laughs> I mean, we even see examples of good wealthy people in, in the Bible. You're going to Luke 7 and Luke 8. 
He said there are and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven nettles, devils, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, uh, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him out of their substance. So this Cusa, uh, Cusa, however you say it, Herod's steward, the wife of Herod's steward, you know, that's Herod the king. Don't you think this lady had some money? If, you're, if you are the wife of, you know, it's always the, you know, if your husband has wealth and you're the wife, you have wealth. That's kind of how it works, right? She had Cousa's credit card, right? She had, she had the debit. She had access to the funds, as it were. And that guy had some money. You're not the king's steward. And not, he's, not, he's going to take care of his own. You know, people in those kind of positions, they get paid well. Especially back then, you know, he's probably, well, you know, his inner circle, he wants to make sure it's people that he can trust that aren't going to, you know, try to do him harm or whatever. But you know what? She, th this lady, Cuzza, the wife of, uh, the wife of Cuzza, Herod Steward, she ministered unto Jesus of her substance. So this is a very wealthy lady. You know what? But that didn't make her a bad person because she ministered unto Christ of her substance. Look there in Luke 7. It says, Now when he had ended all these sayings, verse 1, in the audience of the people, he entered to Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant. So this is a Roman soldier. Right? A centurion. So he was over a hundred men. He was a, like a, he was an officer or whatever. He was high ranking. He said, A certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. So this guy's got a servant. You know, that, that's indicating this guy has wealth. Right? And he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the, uh, the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And they came uh, to Jesus, and they besought him instantly, saying, He is worthy for, he should, uh, for, uh, for whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Now, you know, what does that mean? Do you think that means he went down on the nights and weekends and, and got out the trowel you know, in, in the cement bucket and went to work building a, a synagogue? No, what that means is that he paid to have one built. He hath built us a synagogue. You know, he bought some land or had some land and donated it and gave funds and paid to have that thing built for these, the, the nation, for the Jews. You don't do that unless you have some money. And we know how the story goes. Jesus goes on to say, you know, he has not found greater faith in all Israel besides this man. It was the greatest faith he'd seen because he said, you know, he's not worthy for him to come into his house, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. He didn't even have to go to him. You know, he, he just said, just say it and I believe it. He had great faith and Jesus was, you know, impressed by this guy and, he's a, and he was considered a good man. He had a good reputation, but what else did he have? Wealth, okay? Not all rich people are bad people and I think this is something we got to get in our heads because, you know, especially in the culture and the society we're living today, they you know, they just want to chalk everybody up as the one percent or something like that, and just say, "Oh, well, if you have any kind of wealth, you're just some capitalist, you know, scumbag, or something like that." And you know, having money to a lot of people is is considered like immoral, practically. You know, even if those people come to it by honest means, that they work hard, they build a business, they're smart with their money, that doesn't make them bad people. That just makes them smart and hardworking. That's all it means. You know, and praise God that you live in a place, in a country where you can do that, where you can, you know, excel in that area. Now, I'm not saying that's what we should make our life about, but it's great that we, we live in a place where that's something like that is possible. And we all enjoy the benefits from that, from people making jobs and so on and so forth. Go over to uh, Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23. I mean, there is a warning in the word of God to people that have wealth, right? That's what it said in 1 Timothy 6. He said, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. That was the warning that Jesus gave back in Mark 10. You know, how, that's what makes it difficult for rich people to enter into heaven because they become to trust in their riches. They trust in their own wealth, the power that they have to make money. They think that's what's going to get them in, that you know, they've been a good person or something, and they've, they've made something themselves. He's saying, you know, warn them you know, that, they, that they trust not in certain riches, but in living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may, hold on, uh, uh, may lay hold on eternal life. So Jesus warns people that are rich you know, to conduct themselves in a, in a certain way, that they shouldn't trust in those riches, but rather they should be generous people, and they should use that wealth that they have to further the kingdom of God and lay up for themselves 
you know, treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. That's the warning there. And he also warns people that will be rich, right? In 1 Timothy, he says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to many hurtful and foolish lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money itself. It's, it's how we treat riches, how we approach money, what, how it affects our heart, essentially. That's where the danger is. Not the money itself. I mean, money is a very useful tool. You can, the more money you have, I mean, we can do more things for God because we have money. Because of the funds that come in. And I'm not saying that, you know, faithful words rolling in it or something like that. You know, where this isn't Joel Olstein's church. <laughs> We're building stadiums, packing them out, and charging people to come to church, by the way. You know, you want to come to church? You know, pay your dues. <laughs> you know, but we, the, the offerings come in. We don't really talk about money a lot. I am this morning a little bit, you know, because we're talking about Zacchaeus. But we got a church van out there. We we're able to go out and do trips and, you know, and, and, and reach people and do things and, and further the gospel, right? Why? Because you have a right attitude about money and about riches. Are you in Luke 23, verse 50? Look, not all rich people are bad. And it says in verse 50 of Luke 23, And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. So here, this was his reputation. The same had not consented to counsel in the deed of them. And he was, of Ar- he was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, and he took it down and wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never, before, never man was before laid. And we know from parallel passages that that sepulcher that Joseph laid Jesus' body in was his own. And look, if you had a sepulcher back then, you had money. If you had somebody, I mean, how, I, I'm sure there's some people in the room that love me, okay? But if I came to you and said, hey, I need you to go dig me a grave in the side of the mountain, would you do that? You're not just going to do that for free. <laughs> as much as, and I'm not going to, by the way, don't ask me because I'm not doing it for any of you, right? You can stick, and by the way, you can just put me in a pine bo- box and just bury me right over in that lot for all I care. Not really, though. <laughs> Although, really, you could. But I'm not going to go dig a hole in, this, in a granite mountain for you. I'm not going to go up to Mount Lemon and find some plot of rock and just get out a chisel and a jackhammer and a sledgehammer and just toil and sweat for days and weeks on end just so I can put your dead carcass in there. And nobody did that for Joseph of Marimathea. You know what he ended up doing? He paid some people to do that. How long do you think it would take, to, to especially back then? There's no generators, no electricity, no air hammers, nothing like that. It's all just manual tink, tink, just sledgehammers and chisels and everything else. And just a whole team of guys then hauling all the rock out, getting rid of it, making it nice in there. Look, if you had that happen, if you did that for yourself back then, and, and that's how you're spending your money, well, when, I, when, when you're not even going to be there to enjoy it, you're going to be dead and gone. Well, I'd like to have my body put somewhere nice. You had some money. And the Bible says here that this guy, Joseph Arimathea, was a good man and just not all wealthy people are bad people and we should never get this attitude that just because somebody has money or has wealth that they must be evil and that we should treat them uh, poorly now Zacchaeus now Zacchaeus again he had a well he had his he earned his reputation that it was a bad one right his wealth was ill-gotten gain and he admits it by his own admission and the Bible does say in Proverbs 13, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. You know, there's nothing wrong with the guy who does well for himself through hard work. You know, but the guy that gets wealth by vanity, you know, that wealth is going to take, you know, grow wings and take flight. It's going to d- diminish. You know, the guy that just spends, you know, his, his last few, you know, spends every paycheck that don't, you know, playing the, the lotto or scratch off tickets and, and hits it big, gets a few, you know, gets 10 grand or something like that. You know how quickly that money goes? Easy come, easy go, is the saying. But people that work hard and gather by labor, they shall increase. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6 that godliness with contentment is great gain. So don't write off people just because they have wealth. Don't write off people just because they have a bad reputation. And don't write off people just because of their appearance. Just because of their appearance. And I really want to focus on this one because it's really important. No, I'm just kidding. 
But you, this, is, this is some people do. Sometimes, you know, we're so, we get so carnal sometimes. I mean, it's just human nature to just look at people and just start immediately making judgments about that person. You know, and a lot of times those judgments are accurate. Sometimes we can just look at people and we can say, well, you know, they must be from this part of the world or we can see that the way they're dressed, you know, we can say, well, they must do this kind of work or they're this or that or whatever. There are certain things you could look at people and make correct assessments about them. But a lot of times what we do is we look at people and we just, our own prejudices and our own biases come into play and we end up just assuming things about people based upon the way they look and we end, a lot of times people just write people off over that one thing alone. They haven't even spoken to this person. They haven't even talked to them. They just look at them and they make an assessment and a lot of times what they'll do is they'll just write people off because of the way they look. And that's not what Jesus did. Look at verse 3 in Luke chapter 19. It says, and he, Zacchaeus, right, sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was of little stature. It's a really nice way of saying he was short, right? And look, there's nothing wrong with being short. I was just telling my wife on the way down here how, must it, how nice it, it must be to be small. I just think about all the things that like small people can do, you know, like be more active or not to worry about breaking things when they step on them or you know what I mean? Like I was talking about how oh, I want to do this. I saw this thing on slacklining, right? Who knows what slacklining is? Nobody. All right. Well, they stretch out that little cable, that little, lot, that, that little stretchy band between two trees, and they get up and they walk on it, and they do all those tricks. I thought, man, that looks like fun. That'd be so cool. And then I remember like, you're pushing 280, bud. <laughs> you have to put that line way up there. <laughs> you better not come off, right? Because when you, you're bouncing on it, you know. I look at people on trampolines and say, that must be so much fun. I remember how much it, you know. I, I I remember how much I enjoyed skateboarding when I was younger. You know, like I said the other night, two decades and a hundred pounds ago. You know, and I was getting pretty good at it. And then it's just like, you know, but being a skateboard now, you know, I'm probably going to break it if it doesn't break me first. So there's nothing wrong with being of little stature. In fact, in a lot of ways, it has advantages. Take it from a big guy. It's true. Okay. <coughs> but Jesus didn't see Zacchaeus up in that tree and laugh. He didn't say, well, come on down, short round. You look like you need to eat, you know. He did, he, and, and, and poor Zacchaeus, you know, he wanted to get in there. He wanted to see Jesus, but everyone just kind of muscled him out. No one, there was no compassion. There was no sympathy. It says he had to run ahead of the crowd, right? He feel, oh, Jesus is coming this way. So he said, there's that tree. Let me get ahead of the crowd and get up in this tree. And when he comes by, I'll be able to just look at him, see who he is. He had to do that because he was of little stature. And, you know, we shouldn't just write people off because of their appearance. Jesus didn't. You know, he didn't let that get in the way. You say, well, that seems silly. Would anyone ever do that? James chapter 2. If you want to turn there, you can. Verse 1, it says, My brethren, have not faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with the Lord of, glo uh, the Lord of glory with respect of persons. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come also in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect unto him that weareth a gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves to become judges of evil thoughts? So it might not just be their physical stature, it just might be the way they're dressed. You know, somebody comes in all put together, sharp, looking, you know, has all, every, just put together just right. You know, people will probably, in all likelihood, you know, treat that person a little bit better than the guy who comes in, dressed a little rougher, maybe the clothes haven't been cleaned, maybe he hasn't been cleaned in a while. Maybe, you know, sometimes people come in that are homeless. Some people come in that are, you know, not all there mentally. You know, they're, they have disabilities. They, they, they are poor. They don't have a home. They, they might, you know, be rough around the edges. You know, we should never have this attitude of, well, I'm going to treat that person less. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna be as nice to that person. I'm not gonna have the compassion I otherwise would, you know. But this guy that came in, that you know, has all the money, it looks like, or is all put together, and just you know, looks like he's gonna be a good church person. I'm gonna treat that person well, you know. The Bible warns against that for a reason, and I believe that's why we have the story of Zacchaeus to be reminded that we should not write people off based upon their appearance. <clears throat> Let's go on. Let's just move on to the story for the sake of time. Look at verse 4 of Luke chapter 19. 
And says Zacchaeus, of Zacchaeus, and he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree for to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must abide at thy house. I can't, I'd just love to put myself in these people's shoes. To have been Zacchaeus that day. To say, man, I'd just like to look at him. You know, I would just like to get a glimpse of Jesus. And then have Jesus walk over to the tree you were in and say, come on down, let's go eat. And he made haste, verse 6, and came down and received him joyfully. And I believe this here is the moment of Zacchaeus' salvation. And this is important to understand, because some people will try to take this and teach false doctrine from this passage. I mean, this was the moment, I believe, that, that, that Zacchaeus got saved. Because it says there that he received him joyfully. Right? He, he was already kind of looking for Jesus. He, was always kind of, he already kind of heard, heard about him. He knew who he was. He might even heard Jesus preach. In all, li all likelihood, he probably had. And now he's able to receive him joyfully. Because you've got to kind of consider the fact that Jesus, Jesus just basically invited himself over for dinner. And that's basically what he did here. I'm not saying he was being rude. He was worthy of that honor. I, don't think, and I think if the Lord showed up at any of our doors and said, hey, I, I'm, I'm here for dinner, we would joyfully receive him. Now, if I showed up <laughs> unannounced and said, hey, what's for dinner? You know, I'm here to eat. You say, well, why should we take it? Well, I'm the deacon. Right? You say, well, great, come back. You can do the dishes. Right? Because that's what deacons do. They minister the table. Right? You can clear the plates when we're done, deacon. Right? I mean, Jesus here, he just basically invites himself over for dinner. And, 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 and Zacchaeus wasn't like, don't you know who I am? I, didn't, I don't remember asking you to come over. He received him joyfully because he knew who he was receiving. Do you think if everybody did that to Zacchaeus, that's the re reaction he would have? If somebody just came over, hey, Zacchaeus, I'm coming over. What's for dinner? He probably wouldn't receive every person joyfully. That wasn't Zacchaeus' shtick. You know? This is what he did with Jesus because he understood who Jesus was. I believe this is when he got saved. And it's important to understand that. We'll see here in a minute. I mean, he sought Jesus, right? He was trying to get a, a look at him. And he received Jesus. And because of that, he was moved to good works. Okay? Because a lot of people take you to verse, uh, verse 7 or verse 8, and they'll say, well, this is when he got saved. It's verse 8. It says in verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, of course, this is after they went to his house and ate, and said unto the Lord, Behold, the Lord, uh, behold, and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I will restore him fourfold. Basically saying, I've taken things by false accusation. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. I say, well, see, look, Jesus said that's when he got saved. He said, you know, salvation has come to this house. After he did all these good works. After he repented of all his sin. But wait a minute. He said, Jesus said, this day. He didn't say this moment. And was he even talking about necessarily about that type of salvation, the salvation of his soul? You know, we can read a lot of different things into this if we wanted to. But Jesus, you know, he's saying, like, this day is salvation come to this house. Meaning, you know, it's come to this house this day, not at this exact moment. For as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Now, what made him a son of Abraham? It was his faith. Right? And the Bible says in Galatians 3, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. That means me and you are as much children of Abraham as Zacchaeus was. Because we're all children of Abraham by faith, the Bible says. So that's what made him a child of Abraham. It wasn't the fact that he was of some lineage. You know, Jesus said that, God, that Abraham was of these stones, or John the Baptist said it rather, that he was of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Now, it does say he did some good works there, doesn't it? I mean, he's, he's repenting of his sin. You can't deny that. And Zacchaeus, at this point in the story, is giving half of his poor go goods to the poor. But hey, if, if repenting your sin is what's going to take it to get to heaven, Zacchaeus, you might want to give all your goods to the poor. Why only give half, right? <coughs> he's doing some good works, though. You know, he's trying to restore, make things right. I'm not against that. But I am against saying that's what you've got to do to get saved. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says, For by grace you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In fact, go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Go over there. 
Because here's the thing. There are some things that we should do as Christians, right? And Zacchaeus is a good example of that. There's some things that we should do, but there's some things, there's only one thing that we must do to go to heaven. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, if you're there, in verse 9, we'll go to verse 10 rather, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So we're not, we don't do good works to be saved. He said we're create, we're, uh, we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus unto good works. We get saved. And then we do good works after we're saved, not before. And you know, I think when you read the story of Zacchaeus, it's pretty clear he got saved in the sycamore tree when he came down. And you know what? If he decided after that to not give any of his goods to the poor, if he decided not to uh, you know, restore fourfold to any man that he has defrauded, he would still have gone to heaven. He still would have been a child of Abraham. He would just would have suffered the consequences along the way for being a thief and a liar. <clears throat> there are things we should do. There are things that we have been, uh, there are good works that God has ordained that we should walk in. We should walk in them. But there's only thing we must, thing we, thing we must do to be saved, right? In Acts chapter 16, what must I do to be saved? What must? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the only thing. <coughs> so really what we see from the story is that there's, there's really only two types of people in this world. You know, we want to break things down into so many other categories with people. We want to look at people and say, well, this person's wealthy, this person's poor, this person's middle class. And I understand, you know, that there's a, obviously those statements are true. But spiritually speaking, there's really, you know, only two types of people. It's not just rich and poor. It's not just, you know, people that are of good upstanding citizens or people that have you know, a checkered past. People who have a good reputation and people who have a bad reputation. That's not how God breaks it down. It's not even that there are some people that are, you know, of a better stature than others, you know, based on appearance. These, this, this person is good looking. This person is not. This person is attractive. This person is not. That's not how God sees things. God sees things through, by these, uh, he breaks people down to these two categories. Saved, not saved. Saved, not saved. Born again, not born again. That's it with God. He doesn't look at people and judge them by their, by their, by their, uh, you know, their race. He doesn't judge them by their riches, their wealth. He doesn't judge them by the way they look. He doesn't judge them by their past, any of those things. He judges people based on one thing. Have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or not? That's how God looks at the world. And I'm just trying to admonish us this morning to be reminded of that and to look at the world the same way. Don't write people off. Don't write people off just because you perceive something about them. Oh, they, they're wealthy. You know, they're gonna, they, they probably don't even love God just because they have money. That, you, that's not true. Look at all the people in the Bible that loved God, that had great wealth. You know, don't just look at people and say, well, you know, I'm going to write this person off because they're short. What a stupid reason to write somebody off. Because they, they're not, they don't meet some physical criteria that, that the world has, has said you, this is what people need to look like. Or whatever it is, we write people off for all kinds of different reasons. And we develop bad attitudes. Maybe we would never just come out and say it. Maybe it comes through in our attitude. Maybe it comes the way, through the way we treat other people. We've got to understand, God only sees people. He sees saved people and he sees lost people. And he doesn't just write people off. And neither should we. Don't write people off. Let's go ahead and pray.